Hey everyone, Marcel here. Before we get going, I just wanted to say I'm sorry for missing a couple weeks here. Uh, I had some busy gig weekends. I had some festivals. Um, I also went to North Carolina, but I'm ready to get back into it. There's going to be some new things happening on this channel too, which I'm really excited about. There's going to be more Dobro videos. I'm going to do some Q&A videos where I answer some questions from the comment section. Um, I'm going to do some vlog style videos, probably about some of the things that happened while I was out. Um, I'm also going to do some mini documentaries, which I'm really excited about. And of course, there is the 1,000 subscriber special video. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. I'm so excited that you've all found this channel. You've all subscribed. We have this like mini bluegrass guitar community right here. I love it. I'm so excited that this is happening. Um, let's get into this video finally. So I spent this year going to a bunch of uh, bluegrass festivals, obviously, and playing with a lot of new people. And it seems like in most jams, there is someone who's new, who's trying to figure things out. And everyone's trying to help, and they get a lot of really confusing pieces of advice. And they're all the same pieces of advice that I got when I was starting out. So I'm going to try to fix those statements today. Um, if you can think of any more examples of bad bluegrass advice, please put it in the comments down below. Even if it's not guitar stuff, like bad banjo advice. I think we could all really learn from that. Um, also, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, please consider doing so, or at least give this video a like. It really helps out. Stick to the melody is advice that's always given in the bluegrass community, and it's, it's not that it's bad advice, it's just kind of misleading, and like most advice about improvisation, it's frequently misinterpreted. Obviously, all bluegrass breaks are farther away or closer to the melody depending on the band and the breaks that have come previously in the song. So stick to the melody seems like strange advice, right? In fact, I'm sure you've noticed there's some very iconic Tony Rice guitar breaks that are none of the melody. I think Chris Thiele communicates a much better version of this idea. Um, Thiele says, a beautiful melody needs to be paid tribute to in your soloing. The, the more trivial the melody, the, <clears throat> the more out you can get with your soloing. But a beautiful melody really needs to be paid tribute to during the course of your, of your improvising. Which I think is good advice. What he's telling soloists is to be inspired by the piece you're playing. You can take a motif, a rhythmic or melodic, and you exploit it, basically. But still, uh, what about people who don't play any melody in their solos? In a jam situation, I think the best rule of thumb is melody, motif, make it up. Number one, the first break should be embellished versions of the melody, right? If you're bored of playing the melody, you're you're free to embellish it, put, put things around it, ornaments around it, but you're still playing the melody. This helps set up all of the improvisation that's about to happen, and it helps people that aren't super familiar with the tune get it into their heads again, and that can be <laughs> band members if it's a jam scenario, or it could be audience members, right, if you're playing a show. Number two, the next break should be inspired by the melody. So just like Chris Thiele said, you're, you're paying tribute to the melody. This is probably the most difficult stage, and this is probably what most people would consider bluegrass. It's really kind of at the heart of everything, and you gotta take that melody, and you gotta mix what someone wrote with your own inspiration, and you gotta go somewhere with it. It's hard, and it's hard to explain, too. So number three, if you get a third break in a song, you have a lot of creative license. That being said, I'm still improvising with the same feel, right? If it's an up-tempo bluegrass song, I'm not suddenly soloing like it's a blues. Or, you know, if it's a ballad, I'm not all of a sudden just, you know, shredding 16th notes everywhere. That doesn't make sense. I'm just making up something new that doesn't reference the melody, but in the same style. Once again, this advice is good, but it's very misleading. It, re it really creates more questions than it answers. Uh, what scales do I learn? Major scales, minor scales, modes, major pentatonic, minor pentatonic. And more importantly, what do I do with those scales after I've learned them? There's nothing wrong with learning a million scales. The thing is, the majority of players learn about scale after scale, or approach after approach, for different situations without ever being able to apply anything that they've learned or run. And you don't want to be that guy. I think looking at things from a scale perspective will initially slow you down when you start playing bluegrass. Bluegrass is about playing through changes and being aware of what chord you're soloing over, right? Just like jazz music. 
Um, it doesn't share some of those things you might find in rock music, right? Some of those solos don't really care about what chords they're playing over. That's not true in bluegrass music. Now, if you've just learned a G major scale and you're just trying it over, you know, G, C, and D, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to play an F sharp over a G chord, or you're going to play that B natural over a C chord, right? And those, those things are going to sound really jarring. They're going to sound really weird. There is kind of a simple way to get into it for beginners, and let's do it now. So beginners, try this instead. Uh, learn the G major pentatonic using your open strings. So that's two notes per string from your low E string to your high E string. That's open third, open second, open second, open second, open third fret, open third fret to end. Now you can use the scale over your G chord, your C chord, and your D chord, and generally not have a bad time. But when you're over the C chord, feel free to include any C natural note. So that would be third fret on your A string or first fret on your B string. And when you're playing over a D chord, feel free to include any F sharp note, which would be second fret on both of your E strings or fourth fret on your D string. Now this is just about the simplest way to start making your improvisation start acknowledging the chord changes. This advice is really tough for people that are coming to bluegrass from other genres, like I was just saying, from blues, from rock and roll. Bluegrass is about creating lines that acknowledge the chords that are supporting your break. Licks don't fit into that scheme super well. Books that try to get these licks, books like uh, Hot Licks for Bluegrass Guitar, which I own and I love, but it's hard to look at a four measure lick that goes from a G chord to a C chord and get that in your head and then use it at that exact right moment when you should, when you got two measures of G and two measures of C. It's just kind of a hard thing for your brain to do and that's fine if you want to do that. If that really works for you, that's okay. But what helps you more in the long run, I think, is learning how to structure lines of your own, right? Why would you try to memorize as many as possible when you could just be learning the formula for it? So how do I structure lines? Um, it's all about that vocabulary and the bluegrass voice. So in other words, what, what helps me is recognizing those bluegrass idiosyncrasies. And a lot of times you can find them. They're just three or four notes really that show you the heart of a lick or the heart of a phrase. And you realize that that's bluegrass. You can literally put your finger on it and you realize that the stuff around it doesn't as matter as much as this, you know, little snippet right there. I, I can even give you an example. Here's an example from, uh, uh, 10 beginning bluegrass guitar licks. This is a lick I talk about a lot. It's this Tony Rice ending lick and there's not a lot to it. I use it a lot because it's an easy example and it's normally one of the first few licks that someone uses. So this lick that you've probably all heard, it sounds like this. Sorry my guitar is out of tune. Now you can learn a lot about that lick, even using the pentatonic scale we just talked about. I think the first thing I would grab from that lick is that you can step back onto things you've done, right? We call them back steps. You can, you can do any kind of back stepping in bluegrass. So for instance, this scale, when we go down it, sounds like that. This lick happens to step over the scale again, right? It descends, then goes back up again. You find that any back stepping like that really sounds a lot like bluegrass, right? But we didn't learn that from learning the entire lick, we, we learned that from breaking the lick down. Now I can apply that concept everywhere, right? I can backstep wherever I want. That sounds a lot like bluegrass. Another thing we can grab from that lick would be um, this note right here. Oh, that's outside of the scale. That note sounds really nice, what is that? It's a B flat note. So we know that that B flat sounds good. You might even take it further. Maybe that B flat sounds good when you're about to end a lick, right? Now, I know I'm not giving you any technical reason. I'm acting like I'm someone discovering this for the first time. That's how it works. So now I know I can include this B flat note. What if I just did a bunch of backstepping or stepping over notes I've already played and then every once in a while including that B flat note? That sounds a lot like bluegrass. And now I have an infinite number of licks as opposed to just the one.
So this really only needs a quick clarification here. Um, what's really being said here is chord tones are always okay and leaning on notes from the current chord demonstrates that you know where you are in the form. And that's exactly what we were talking about when I was saying you could use the pentatonic scale and include the notes from the C chord or include the notes from the D chord. Um, to a further extent, playing out of chord shapes, uh, or rather using chord tones just in general, um, helps you figure out melodies as well. But bluegrass melodies are generally pretty straightforward and they use a lot of notes and basic chords. So a lot of times you can just hold down a chord and you can find a lot of the notes in a melody. So playing out of the chord shapes really helps you get bare bones of a melody. This last one is so stupid. How are you going to learn the song then? Sit out for the kick. Sit out for the verse. Sit out for that first chorus. But then after that you can get a picture of how the song is going and you can kind of sneak back in and you won't ruin anything, right? As long as you're getting that picture of the song. Hey, maybe you sit out the kick, you sit out the verse, you sit out the chorus and you say, man, this song's got 300 chords in it. I remember the first time I was in a jam and someone played Steam Powered Airplane and I was like, alright, I'm probably not going to get this one, let me just sit out the tune. Um, if you feel embarrassed about that, if you feel worried about that, number one, don't feel worried. People sit out tunes all the time. I mean, if you went to a big jam with a bunch of hot shots, I'm sure one of them would call a jam buster and, you know, four out of five people would know it and those four would play the tune anyway. You can sit out. It just doesn't matter. Anyway, if you like this video, please comment, please subscribe. Uh, you can check out the website. It's LessonsWithMarcel.com. There's a bunch of tabs in the tab store that are all classic fiddle tunes and even more. Um, there's a bunch of free lessons on there too. Just, it's tons of free stuff. Just go check it out. Um, you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is particularly fun because I post pictures from gigs that I play and whatever else I do. Uh, please follow me there. Till then, I'll see you in the next video.